church family we are so glad that you are joining us today as we continue our series called taking more territory and allow god to have more territory in our hearts welcome to pathway church i'm jared piney your online pastor and today i'm joined by nicole conkle our online host yes welcome to pathway church we want to encourage you to share this service right now so others can join you to hear an impactful message you can copy the link or text it to a friend or if you're on facebook just click that share button all right, Nicole, here's a question for you. What is one thing that you love about Pathway Church? Okay, there's lots of things. I know. We've had, one, well, this, ha- this question's come up a lot, but I mean, it will always be. It's always been the people. Like, there's so many different people that you can connect with and then that you stay connected throughout. 
throughout your journey, whether you're still here at Pathway or you've moved to a different state. It's just fun making those connections. Yeah, the church happening. isn't yeah. brick and mortar, it's the people, right? Yep. What about you? Um, I'd say, so I, I've had some conversations this week that's just been awesome of new people landing at our different campuses. And they've been here not that long, but they already feel like they've got family, they've got mm. good friends. God's working with them and their family, and it's just awesome to see God moving that way. Yes. So new people getting connected um, and being a part of a family is awesome. Yes, so. part of the old connections that you have, too, is moving yep. in there. So yep. it's, I love it. Those are my favorites. If this is your first time with us, we hope that this is your first time of many times. If you're new, then you are at the right place. No matter where you are in your faith, this is a great place to connect with Jesus and other people. And if you are new to Pathway, then let us give you a free coffee to Starbucks. Just text the word NEW to 316-444-4180. We'll send you a digital gift card that you can use on your next trip to Starbucks. Okay, and when we say NEW, we mean this could be your first time watching, or maybe that means that you've been watching for the last several weeks or even months, but our online team hasn't had a chance to meet you yet. We would love to get to meet you, and that starts by you texting the word NEW to the number on the screen below. Well, next week is going to be special as we have a guest interview and he has a really awesome story to share with you. On March 4th and 5th, entrepreneur and philanthropist Pete Oaks will be here to talk about how God has really opened his eyes and heart toward how he stewards the resources he has been blessed with. You know, it's a remarkable story of the lives he's transforming at the Hutchison Prison and how God has taken more territory in his heart. You really don't want to miss this interview. So mark your calendar. Bring a friend, and it will be a great service. Let's get ready for the message from our executive pastor, Rodney Elliott, as we follow the story of Abraham and give God more territory in our hearts. Feel free to open up the Pathway app, click on the weekly guide, and follow along with the message notes. Here we go. Well, I want to welcome our entire Pathway family, no matter where you're watching and joining us today. And I'm excited because this series is challenging. How many of you are up for a challenge? I can tell a few of you are like, that's not what I came for today. But we're going to do it anyways, all right? And so this series is called Taking More Territory. And Pastor Carter last week really did challenge us to be willing to go on a journey. And we're talking about this journey of generosity really in a different way as we look through the life of Abraham. And so I had a, someone ask me a great question yesterday as they said, how do I know if I'm ready to go on this journey? Like, part of me wants to go, but then there's a part of me, the cynical side. Anybody's got that in them? The cynical side that you don't want to go. Well, I simply ask them two questions like, number one, do you want God to have more power in your life and more presence? And I believe if you're here, you do in some way, no matter where you're at. Maybe you don't even believe today yet. You haven't accepted Jesus, but you're here for a reason. You're like, I want more of God. I know I need it. Or maybe you followed Jesus for 30 years, and you're like, you know what? That would be good for me. I need more. And then the second question, and it was kind of funny, when I asked him, I said, do you want to be a more generous person? And he said, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, let me ask you the other question. Do you want to be a more selfish person? Anybody want to raise their hand and say, yep, that's what I want. That's why I'm here. Like, none of us want that. 
So that's why when you can answer yes, it's like, yes, I want more of God. And yes, I want to be more generous. Like this journey is for you. Now today, as we really say yes to the journey like we did last week, we're going to begin to learn about some of the major building blocks that really we have to have as we go on this journey and how God stretches and grows us and ultimately how he takes more territory in our lives. And today we're going to be talking about trust. Now in our world, we have been told not to trust anyone. Have you been told that? I have. Like, don't trust anybody. And somebody even said amen to that. I was like, that's, that's not where we're going. <laughs> that's just not where we're going. Like, we're actually going to learn how to trust not just anyone, but how do we trust God? How do we trust God? And trust with God, it's tricky, especially when we've been polluted, that we cannot trust anyone. Now, trust is a challenging thing because I actually believe in most of our lives, how we do our daily lives, we're pretty self-dependent. And so really when we even say, do you trust that person? We're like, yeah, I trust that person. But what really are you trusting that person for? Like even the people we trust, it's not really a stretch to say we trust them, especially in the easy But when life gets challenging, trust gets difficult, doesn't it? Now, one of the most powerful moments in my life where I got to experience and try to better understand what trust is, is when me and my friends on a spring break outing, we did the trust jump. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of what that looks like, okay? Now, to give you an idea, what they do is we drove out there, and there's this 75-foot-tall, basically electric pole. Just pole, and it's, it's about 12 inches around. And so we show up. I didn't know what we were getting into because I don't like heights. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, whoa, we have a problem. But then I was like in this position, do I want to seem like the the weak one in the group, you know, and so I sucked it up. And so what you do is you climb up this pole and then you stand on top of it. And then there's this orange ball out in front of you and you jump to try to touch the ball. Now, whenever it comes to heights, I'm really not afraid of the height. What I'm afraid of is not even the fall. I'm afraid of hitting at the ground level. Are you with me? Like, I don't want to hit. And so they began to tell me the only way that I will not hit is my two friends will be holding ropes as I jump and they will, like, bring me to the ground where I won't hit. Now, what's interesting is if you would have asked me before we went, I would have told you I trusted these guys. But see, I I trusted them like, you know, like they wouldn't say bad things behind my back about me, things like that. I, I trusted them with driving the car to the ropes course. But do I trust them to hold the rope, right? So I climb up that post, and I'm not kidding you, I get to the top and I begin to like hold it. You know, because I'm like looking at these two guys, I'm like, are they going to catch me? And I froze up there and I like froze and I'm like I'm like how it looks hard to climb down but it looks really scary to jump and I have to trust them and so the amazing thing about it was I kind of logically figured out jumping was going to get me to the ground safer than climbing down even though one of my friends was like I'm not holding the rope you know kind of stuff So eventually, I decided to trust. It was a decision. And I jumped, and I even touched the ball. And they caught me. See, it was the trust of who was holding the rope. Now, what was interesting about that is once I finally trusted, like, it was exhilarating. 
Like, it was awesome. It really was. Even though I was like overcoming your fear and all that, it was a great experience. And to think that a lot of times in myself, if I wouldn't have been challenged not to want to look like the weak one, I would have been the guy that would have been like, I'm not climbing that pole. But I would have missed out. You see, when we don't trust, we miss out on lots of things. And so for a lot of us in this area of generosity, we're either standing on the ground looking up at this pole and we're just like, I ain't getting on that thing. That's where we are. Maybe that's where you are today. Or there's some of us, we actually climb up the top of the pole. We actually kind of know what needs to be done, but we like, we're holding on to it. We're like, I don't know. Will I get caught? Will, will, will God catch me? You know, I think we're all in different places, and then there's some of us where we have jumped, and we're the testimonies of God's faithfulness because God does provide in supernatural ways, and when we open ourselves to him, it's amazing, and he does take more territory. Now, we're going to learn from the life of Abraham every week during this series, but before we dive into his story, some of you, I know you're asking this question. I just know. I can feel it is what does trust really have to do with my money? And I'm going to show you something. Some of you don't even know what this is. This is called cash. (laughs) Right? This is called cash. None of us carry it anymore, but this is real money. Okay? This is really what money looks like. It's, It's fun. You can feel it, all that kind of stuff. Most of our money you can't. But what's interesting is you're like, what does money have to do with trust? If I read on the back of this bill, it says what? In God we trust. That at least should make you pause and wonder. Number one, it's like you can go study the history. Some of it has really well intentions. Others, it's kind of politically motivated why it's there. But here's what I think, is we have a supernatural God who has a reason and uses many things in our lives. And when I looked at this on the back, I was like, this is where the war of trust in our culture is really lived out, isn't it? This is ground zero of trust for many of us. Like we can trust God with a lot of stuff, but it's like, my money? Ah, it's difficult. And so we have to come in this very open and know that it's sensitive. It's going to be challenging and difficult. Now, as we look at the life of Abraham trying to look at trust, you know, Abraham was willing to go on the journey. And by the way, as we read these texts today, he's going to be referred to as Abram. Well, as he goes through this transformation, his name changes. But I'm going to use those two names interchangeably. And so he's willing to go on the journey. And then God does something really amazing, and he really does this with us, which we'll talk about later, is he actually enters into a deal with God. But it's not really a deal. They call it a covenant. You've probably heard that word, but it really is an agreement that they enter into. And this is the moment when God makes his promises to Abram, Abraham. This is when trust is the most difficult because God is going to tell him something that his mind cannot even fathom. You see, that's when trust is difficult, is when we're on the top of the post, and we're about to see Abram get on the top of the post. Abraham is going to be up there. Will he jump? Will he trust? And so I want to invite you, you can open up your Pathway Church app, or you can follow along on the screen or follow along in your own Bible in Genesis chapter 15. Now, this is a really interesting interchange because Abraham has a conversation with God. And so you really get to see God's heart and you get to see Abraham's heart at the same time. And so we're going to start with Genesis 15 verse 1. It says there, the, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And God said this, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. 
Now, as God is saying this, you know, he's basically communicating, Abram, I am your protector. I am your shield. I am your reward. I am with you. You are blessed. Now, for most of us, if we hear things from God like that, or even as we read them in the scriptures, sometimes it's really hard for us to believe. Like the good things that God says about us, like we're his children, we're forgiven. Like you ever have a hard time believing those things? And that's what happened to Abraham. Is he has kind of this questioning moment as he's like, I want to believe, but I have so many questions about how this could be true. And so it goes on in verse 2 and it says this, but Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Now for us, we kind of have to better understand why this not having an heir thing is such a big deal. You see, in that culture, if you didn't have a son to hand your estate to, you had failed. You were worthless. And Abram was 75 years old. Abraham was an old man. And so he sat there and he's just like, God, how can you be my great reward? How can I be this blessed? How can you be my protector when I don't even have an heir? Now, here's the thing. A lot of times in the scriptures, we think Abraham is like angry at God. He's shaking his head. No, he's just calmly asking a question. And we know that because he starts it very humbly. And he says, sovereign Lord, here's my question. How can this be true? And so he really heard what God said. He listened and he asked a question. And you know, the thing about God is he doesn't get angry with Abraham. He doesn't get angry. As we pick it up in verse 4, he says this, Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now you talk about a moment of trust. All right, this is a moment. I want you, just think about how crazy this is. Some of us, if we grew up with the scriptures, we're just like, this is the story. But Abraham has no son. He's 75 years old. And God says, basically, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. How is that possible? Like maybe with something small, he could have trusted God. But he's got to trust God with this promise that sounds impossible. He asks a question, and then God gives him this moment where God's like, climb up the pole and look down. This impossible thing I'm going to ask, this impossible promise that you have to believe, it's going to happen. Will you jump and trust? You know, I think a lot of people would have walked away, but you see, Abraham and his faith was different. And so for us, as we learn about trust, and we learn about really what it looks like to jump for that ball, we need to understand Abraham a little bit more and how he lived and how this interaction with God really played out. So the first thing we can learn from Abraham is this, is listen to God with the huh. Okay? Say that out of the huh. Everybody say huh. Huh. Okay, now I'm going to really qualify this. It's not the huh your children give you when you ask them to do something and they go, huh? They're just not listening. All right. Abraham actually heard something 
from God. And he said, you know what? I'm going to go, huh? And I'm going to ask a question. And then I'm going to listen again. You see, most of the time when we hear something crazy, and if you're really going to grow trust, you can't just trust God that he'll provide food for you every day. Like, that's a good thing. But if it only goes there, trust will not grow. You see, Abraham leaned in and he was like, huh, let me ask you this, God, how can this be? And then God gives him an answer and it was something. Most of us, when we heard the first phrase by God, a lot of times when it sounds impossible, we just stay on the ground or we completely walk away and we're like, that's not God. That's not something he would say. But you see, Abraham leaned in. And you know, after he asked that question and God gave him the answer, this is what is crazy. And we see trust. We see trust in Abraham really pretty immediately. Because it says this in Genesis 15, 6. It says, Abram believed the Lord and he, God, credited it to him as righteousness. You see, when God told him that your offspring will be as numerous as the stars, Abraham believed. He said, God, I'm going to jump off this post knowing that you have the ropes. I'm going to jump for that ball because I know who holds the ropes. Now, for many of us in this list, and a lot of times, it's difficult because Especially if it's the first time we feel like we heard God tell us to do something that's pretty crazy. And a lot of times it does have to do with giving because it's pretty crazy, right? Why would I give up? I could do so much with this money, God. Why would I give? It's crazy. Is a lot of times when we think we hear something from God, what we do is we stay on the ground and we're like, can't be God, and we walk away. But you see, we need to listen with the huh And try to better understand and see if it's God. And so how do you listen with the huh? I believe there's like two ways. Really, the first way is to pray and actually spend time with God. That's what Abraham was doing. He was spending lots of time with God. Having conversations. When the last time you prayed and you asked God, not just for your own needs, but really said, God, how can you take more territory in my life? God, what does this look like? And then you cover those times with scripture that speaks powerful truth to you. So I open my Bible and I I hear from God. Because then when I hear something and I look at God's word, what does it do? If it sounds like God, it is God. And you see, that's what happened for Abraham is he heard God. He's like, does that sound like God? Sounds like God. So he believed. He believed. He believed in the one who was holding the ropes And so he trusted him. And so for you and I, we don't take time to do either one of those. And then there's even another step is trusted followers of Jesus that God has put around us. We can ask them. It's like, does this sound like God? Does it sound like God that I would release and give my resources to the work of his kingdom? Does that sound like God? It sounds like God. And so it's like we need confidence as we listen with the huh, and we ask questions, and we really try to figure out if it's the direction for our lives. You know, for me, I remember the first time I heard something, and it was in this kind of area of giving, where I really felt like God challenged me, and it was in a service much like this, where the message was like this, and it was like, lean in and listen, what would God have you give? And I would say before for me, I thought there was like some math equation about what I should give. And I was trying to figure out the math. But when I was challenged to really seek God, what was crazy is through a week of seeking God, I heard something. And it scared me. You see that? That's, that's, that's what God's voice sounds like. It's scary. And what he told me to do, because I really wasn't a very good giver. Like giving for me is difficult. And I wasn't a good one. 
I wasn't consistent, and when something in my life trumped something that God wanted to do, I would just be like, well, that must not be God, and I'm going to do it. And so I leaned in to listen, and God told me really to give to this one thing more than I'd ever given in my entire life to anything. And so my wife and I continued to pray, and I started talking to people who were in my small group. And I was like, could this, is this God? And I was praying, they'd say, no, that's not God. But you know what they said? No, that sounds like God. And so what I found myself doing is listening with the hum and getting off the ground and climbing up and getting on the pedestal. I hadn't jumped yet, but I was like listening with the hum. You know, some of us need to do that. We need to really spend time and lean in and listen because that is the place that trust. How can you trust God when you don't know what he wants for your life? What his desires are for you. And so for all of us, we need to listen with a huh. Now, the second thing is this, is obedience is a must to grow trust. All right? I made that rhyme so you'd remember it, Okay? Obedience is a tr- is a must to grow trust. And so what I mean by this is really we can even stand on top of that post. And you see trust only happens when you jump. That's when it happens and that's when it's a little scary. Well there's something that's kind of crazy that happens in our story. Is there's this weird moment It seems like it doesn't have to do with anything, but it's all about this obedience thing. I think because remember obedience, the beginning, when we do even simple things that don't make sense that God tells us to do that sound like him, in the end we see him do amazing things and our trust grows. And so if we pick up the reading in verse 9, it says this, So the Lord said to Abraham, Bring me a heifer, a cow, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Now, how many of you are thinking, what does a cow have to do with a covenant, right? Hey, I thought that. It's it's an honest question. It's like, what does this have to do with it? Well, God gives him a simple instruction that sounds out of this, like, what does this have to do with my offspring being as numerous as the stars in the sky? But you see, obedience is a must to grow trust, right? So you see, Abraham does exactly what he says. And when we do, when we obey God in things that don't make sense in our lives, something always happens. It always does. And so in verse 17, it says, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared. It just appears and passed between the two pieces. Now, my family and I were blessed to go on a trip to Disney World, and I think I was on that ride where a smoking fire pot appeared, three-dimensional, like it was crazy. But you see, for Abraham, this actually happened. It actually happened. He followed God and something didn't make sense. And so he's like, okay, God, you're God. I trust you. I'm going to do exactly what you say. And then something supernatural happened. Something supernatural that he couldn't believe. And what do you think that did for Abraham? He trusted God. He was obedient. God did something supernatural. What do you think happened to his ability to trust God? Did it shrink or did it grow? It grew, didn't it? You see, that's what happens for all of us. And I think many times we're the people sitting on the ground, right? We're sitting on the ground and we're like, that can't be God. That sounds weird. I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to jump. And what we miss out on is the supernatural. Because that was the conversation during COVID, right? Is We just want to get back to normal. Normal is lame. Is anybody with me? Who wants normal? I didn't follow Jesus so that I could be normal. I followed Jesus so that it could be supernatural. 
You see, for all of us, we should want that supernatural life, and it starts with obedience and trust. So it just keeps growing. And what happens is God asks you to do crazier and crazier things, and as your trust grows and grows, you get to see more and more supernatural. You see, that's what he wants for all of us. You know, for me, when me and my wife were really up on top of that post and challenged to give like we'd never given before, the moment came, where were we going to obey? Where are we going to jump? And you know, Jenny, she got in a little quicker than I did. But honestly, when I looked back at my life, I thought, man, it had looked too normal. I've got to trust. And so, on top of that post, I remember the first time, like we had a big give kind of weekend. That we came ready to give, and I shook a little bit. Because it's scary. God, are you really holding these ropes? And the math equation doesn't make sense sometimes. And we knew we were going to have to give up things. But you know, I'm so grateful in that moment I had people around me. I had God's word and God's Holy Spirit speaking that for the first time, many times I'd said no. I can't tell you how many times I said no, but that time we jumped. And I'm telling you to this day, it's one of the scariest jumps. But to watch what God did in his provision and how he took more territory inside of my heart, it was the number one thing that I did early in my journey that changed the trajectory of my life. You see, I believed in who was holding the ropes in a new way for really the first time. And man, it was exhilarating as we jumped. It was scary, but it was amazing to watch over the next few years as we continued how God provided. How we started saying yes to him and no to other things because we watched the supernatural happen in our lives. You see, that's what journey God wants for every person. He wants that for all of us. Now, there's one more thing that we can't miss in this story. Because if you kind of take all this up, you think there's like an equation that we can do to like do this. But you see, trust really depends on who's holding the ropes, doesn't it? Like you just can't trust anybody and you just can't trust in anything. But you see, in our scenario, God is holding the ropes, Now, there's something amazing about this story, and there's something amazing for you and I. Is that when we look at this covenant deal that he makes with Abraham, that God does, what we have to realize is Abraham makes zero promises, but God makes all the promises. Have you ever thought about it like that? Like, God didn't even require Abraham to promise anything. Abraham believed, and then he obeyed. But there was no promises, because you know how obedience goes? Sometimes you miss it, right? And we know in the story, as it goes on, as we're going to learn over the next few weeks, Abraham failed. But you see, that's why God said all the promises are on my side. You see, no matter what, Abraham, if you believe Your offspring, this is going to happen, it's certain, are going to be more than the stars in the skies. And for you and I living in the new covenant that Jesus brought to this earth, the new covenant where our sins are forgiven by his one sacrifice, and he was on that cross and he said, it is finished. It is finished. You see, God made all the promises. He did all the work. And for us, it is to believe and to obey and to follow that. But he knows we're not going to be perfect. And that's why God gives us promises so that we know that he's faithful. We'll see him work in the midst of trusting him. You see, he says this in Romans 8, 1 through the writer. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a promise 
He isn't going to take it back. It's a promise. It's guaranteed. In Deuteronomy 31.8, God says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. God's with you. Do you feel that today? Like that's real. That's a promise. God doesn't break his promises. That's a promise. And then John 16, 33, Jesus said this. Part of this promise I don't like, if I'm honest. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. That's the part I don't like. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Promise. You see, as we get on top of that post, and we think about jumping. We know who holds the ropes. It's like our lives need to get a little crazier, a little more less predictable as we listen with a huh to what God wants for our lives. And then as we hear and we climb up and we look at that ball out there and we're like, God, are you going to catch me? We obey in what we hear. And it grows our trust. And we step into the supernatural life that God wants for us. Now, no matter where you're at in this journey, that life is there for each of us. And so what I want to do as we close is pray and just ask God to give us the courage, to give us the faith, to trust in Him who holds the ropes in our lives. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you, God, for the opportunity we have today to come and learn from Abraham's life. God, I pray for courage that would rise up in all of us. That, God, I I fear that just like me, that my brothers and sisters, that, God, we've lived too normal of lives. That, God, you have a supernatural life A life that means we climb to the top and we jump. God, I pray that that kind of trust would mark our lives. But God, I know that trust is difficult, and especially as we're talking about, God, how we give. And not just giving to your mission, but also in our lives, God, every day we have opportunities to be generous. That God, we listen to your spirit about what that looks like in our lives. That, God, that we would be open and we would do as Abraham did. We would believe and we would trust and we would jump. God, I know the world would be different. Our lives would be different and the supernatural would come to earth. And so right now, I just want all of us really to confess that if we want to live that life of trust, if we want to have God take more territory, God, we need courage, and we really, truly need the courage that can only come from the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us to jump. And so right now, if that's you, and you need to trust God, you need that trust in Him to grow so that you'll jump. I just want you to declare that to Him, that you want His help. You're willing, but you need His help. Raise your hand no matter where you're at. If you need His help to grow your trust, hands all over. Let me pray for all of us. Father, I thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to engage in the supernatural with you. God, I pray for courage, that, God, we would trust you with all areas of our lives, including the resources that we have. That, God, our lives would be marked by generosity, but in every area of our life, we would trust you more and more as we obey you, more and more as we listen as we see your heart for what you want our lives to look like. God, we know you want the best. You want us to have an exhilarating life that looks like you. So God, I pray that you would help us as we grow in our trust. God, I also know that there's many in this room and there's many watching this that they have never accepted Jesus for the very first time. 
You know, ultimately, that is the greatest jump of trust that you can ever make is to accept Jesus to be the leader and the savior of your life. And so if you want to take that leap, if you want to step into the supernatural life where all your sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done and he promises you a different kind of life, I just want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me in the quietness of your heart. Father, I know that I've settled for normal. I know that my, I've fallen short and my sin and my shame and my guilt has separated me from you. But today, Jesus, I lay those things down and I grab hold of the grace and the forgiveness that you offer me through your perfect sacrifice that you made on the cross so that all my sins would be forgiven and I would be free. And today, Jesus, I choose to follow you and live the life that is truly life that is only found in you. Now, with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I just want you to declare that decision to God boldly by simply raising your hand and so that I can pray for the decision that you made. Raise your hand right now if you prayed that prayer for the very first time. Raise your hand. Awesome, I see you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, God. For those who have stepped into a new relationship with you today, God, I pray and I thank you, God, that they have jumped into that relationship with Jesus. God, I pray that your spirit would guide them and God, that they would truly experience the supernatural life as they listen to you and they obey. God, I'm grateful that the life you want for us is greater than anything we could imagine. God, I pray that we would trust that as we follow you, that we will experience that. And God, your kingdom will grow. God, we pray all this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. That message was such a great reminder to trust God more and allow him to have more territory in our heart. You will often hear us talking about giving as the next step in your faith journey. Generosity is a way to bring you closer to God and the plan he has for your life. You know, it's amazing to think about my wife Andrea and I's giving story. Each time we have taken a step to trust God more, to give him more territory in our hearts, this kind of happened the same way each time. We've been challenged in a series sort of like this, to seek God's will and then see what that means about being more generous. We have a conversation, then we pray about it, and, and always the fear of losing security is an emotion that I feel sometimes. Then after that, we have taken steps in our generosity. We don't always take those steps, but each time that we have, it started with seeking God first, listening to Him, talking together, and then being obedient. So my question is, where are you in your journey? Are you excited about the path that God has you on, or are you struggling to understand His plan for your life? Does the thought of giving money away make you anxious? I'm here to tell you that the blessing comes when we release control and allow God to take up space in our heart. I've seen it, and I believe that it can happen for you too. But being generous it doesn't just happen. Generosity starts with an intentional decision to allow God to take up more territory in your heart and in your soul. God wants you to lean in and trust Him more. At the end of this series, we're going to give you an opportunity, a challenge, if you will, to go on a journey of generosity with us. We are going to take 90 days to give it away you never have before. A way that is fully surrendered, radically changing, that changes you, that moves your heart in a way that causes a real difference in your life. You know, this week I was reminded that God is one step away. We had a gathering for new people at one of our campuses, and it was amazing. I loved hearing how people first got connected to Pathway Church, and then better yet, how they are engaging with God and finding good friends at the campus. It was incredible. You know, many of these people were invited by a friend to Pathway. Then, like you, they watched online first to check it out. Then they attended a campus. This is a reminder that invitations matter. This week, invite someone to watch with you next week as we continue our series. Well, before we worship God during these next two songs, 
I want us to look at this verse in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 29. It says this, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, it tells us in the Bible that it was Abraham's faith that made him right before God. We have inherited that same promise today, that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, then we are forgiven of our sins and made right before God. It's not because of something we do or something that we're good at, but because we trust God who never breaks his promises. Think about that and praise God during this next song, Holy Water.
Your blood, you bought my freedom.